Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this session. I am super excited to be here today. So if you are just tuning in today, we are going to be doing an HBS mock interview. Um, and in case you don't know, why is she doing an HBS mock interview specifically versus some other schools? Well, the Harvard Business School interview is different from any other school's interview. Uh, they, instead of having simply just a copy of your resume, and asking questions based on that. The interview will have read your entire application inside and out. Um, and so, for example, questions like, walk me through your resume. I mean, I might ask that, but as an interviewer, I don't know that, like, I already know your resume. I know your story pretty well at this point, right? If, you, if you've written a good application, at least, I know your story pretty well, right? So uh, the questions are usually very specific and tailored to the candidate. So. That's why I think this is a useful session to watch, hopefully. Um, and so in case you don't know who I am, my name is Maria. I myself am a graduate of Harvard Business School, and I have been giving admissions advice since 2003. And I'm the founder of Applicant Lab, which is an online platform uh, that provides admissions consulting advice for a teeny fraction of what other admissions consultants want to charge for it. Uh, and today we have a user who is actually preparing for his, his actual HBS interview. Um, we did not find out, we did not orchestrate it this way, but we found out completely coincidentally uh, <laughs> right before, right before this, uh, we, were setting, we were setting things up that this person actually used Applicant Lab. So I didn't do that on purpose. It's just a happy coincidence. Um, okay, so I, you know, I would ask you, normally I would ask you to introduce yourself, but you know, we don't, I don't know that you, we don't really want to do that because we're trying to sort of emulate uh, the HBS interview as much as possible. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through a couple of questions. It won't be, it probably won't be as long as a real HBS interview, just a few highlights to get a sense of it. Uh, and then I will give feedback. And then if at the end we have time, we will take audience questions. So thank you, by the way, for volunteering to be here. <laughs> I, know, I know it's- Thank uh, you so much. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here and interacting mm -hmm. with the audience and you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, all right. So, you know, I noticed that you attended a, a very elite university within your country. And a lot of times people who go to that university end up going to elite employers. However, you instead after college decided to go to a manufacturing company, a European manufacturing company that really isn't a household name. Uh, and so I was just wondering, like, why did you make that choice? Absolutely happy to share that. Uh, so in my case, the decision was mainly driven by my, my experience in my college, right? So I was really passionate about uh, hackathons. And since my college was in India, Silicon Valley, uh, I really enjoyed building solutions. And here was this manufacturing firm which wanted to experiment with technology and said, hey, you know, why don't you build this new solution for us? We have never ventured into this technology. I give you the responsibility. Go ahead and try this out. If you fail, it's not a problem. Just try it. So that was something which was really exciting me. And of course, the international experience which came with that, like you get to go to a new country. I think that was amazing for me. Right. And so when you started out, though, you were you were in a new country, but you were still within Asia. You were in, in Southeast Asia. Um, did they tell you specifically that you were eventually going to get to move to Europe or you were just hoping that? that no, 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 no. I didn't know that. So for me, it was more like uh, let's take, take this like one bit at a time, probably a year experiment with how this thing goes so uh, it was try the solution out in the southeast asian market does that is, is that is that you know picked up by the users if so maybe it can become something big otherwise well uh, you can still work in southeast asia but there was no plan of going to europe all right cool and during that time that you were in southeast asia you convinced the ceo of the company to adopt a new technology idea that you came up with i'm just curious you were one year out of college so pretty junior and you were on another continent because the CEO is based in Europe. So how exactly did you go about convincing the CEO to adopt your idea? Yes, yeah, so the, the story behind that was uh, this company had actually come to our college and hosted a hackathon where uh, me and my team had pitched an idea which uh, was of course not a solution but more like a minimum product. And uh, the CEO was not fully convinced into it. So when I moved to uh, the Southeast Asian country, we actually made a mock, uh, mock of that app on Facebook. So it was just like the UI, like they would see how the screens would move, not the actual app. And they said, wow, this is something which our users could like. So uh, we can talk and get the investment done for this. So that was the main turning point that we, we actually built 
a mock solution for it rather than a complete solution first. And that's how I think the CEO said, okay, we can try this. All right, cool. Um, however, <laughs> that's the good news. The bad news is that once you launch this new um, product, your own internal team did not adopt it. And you said, and it's understandable, um, that they were worried that they were going to lose their jobs. So what do you think, whose responsibility was it, do you think, to socialize this idea amongst the workforce? Do you think the CEO should have stepped in? Or do you think that maybe you should have done something a little bit sooner to get them warmed up to the idea? Absolutely, Maria. So the product was a failure, just to put it in simple words. Right in the starting, <laughs> nobody had uh, adopted it, and and when when our team, when I had built this with my team, we were very happy about it. Wow, this is like the best technology. This company has never seen this uh, cool stuff. So let's do it. But when what we saw was when we launched it, people just like the, the account managers just didn't use it, and I think on that part, it was on our front to actually understand why they didn't do it, not the CEO, not anyone else, but actually our own team that, you know, what was their decision making process? Like, what was it that didn't take with them? Right. So that was something which was on us. And uh, that's how I started probing more into this uh, solution. OK, awesome. And um, another sort of jumping around, something you did is you actually hired uh, on your on your team a refugee uh, from Afghanistan. and. I'm just wondering, that sounds to me like a bit of a risk, right? Unless this person happened to have studied technology in their home country. Just can you walk me through kind of how is it how is it going? I, I applaud your humanitarian instinct. Bravo. But I don't was it has it was it actually the best idea for your team or has it been sort of bumpy to onboard this person? Uh, absolutely. So the, the background story of that is the applicant is actually really qualified, just that the applicant did not have the enough resources. And what the, the, the way I got when I got to know the candidate, uh, you know, her story and the struggles which she's had, of course, she's a very qualified person working in a very uh, eminent company. But it's just that the resources which she had growing up are not enough to give her the platform. And I think that was something which uh, appealed to me when, when I discussed her solution with her, which she was uh, pitching her resume. I think all that was in place. So uh, I think that was not not. Super bumpy, you know. Of course, there were logistical issues in, in in you know bringing the person all the way to Europe, but the person was really qualified. All right, excellent. Um, so recently you have moved from uh to a new to a new job, pretty recently, uh, a new role within the company. And previously, it said that you were you were co-leading a team, a slightly larger team of people with someone else. But now you are the sole leader of of a group. So. What's been the hardest thing for you transitioning from co-leading a team to being the sole leader of a team? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. The, so the thing here was that when I was co-leading a team, a lot of the decisions uh, were taken in a joint way, right? So that we had like the product manager taking in the decisions and we were doing this together. But now when I'm now leading the team by myself, uh, one issue which I face is, of course, taking all these decisions by myself. The onus is on you to take the right decision. And second of all, uh, there's no, there's, you don't have a partner, right? So you now also have to uh, deal with other leaders in your organization who, of course, don't report to you but are very senior, and you're trying to convince them into, uh, you know, either getting some technology built or buying into an idea, and, and they are not in your organization. So basically, the scope has expanded, and these people who don't report to you to influence them, I think that's been a bit of a challenge for me. And I know you're pretty new in this role, but have you had an opportunity yet to successfully convince or have you tried to convince someone and had it not be, been successful? Uh, some of these people that you mentioned a second ago that don't report to you? Uh, I mean, just it's been two months uh, into my new role, yeah. but uh, actually the, there was a project which was ongoing, which I onboarded myself onto. And I think that is something we have already managed. For example, the head of finance is ready to go and implement a new AI solution uh, because we managed to show him the benefits it could uh, we could bring in. So it's not totally my, I'm not taking that. Like, I did this because this is happening like since one year, but I am now the owner for that product. So I think that bit is done. So we have some investments coming in and, and we plan to build this product for the finance team now. Okay, great. Um, so uh, something you've done during the pandemic is you built a digital app to help children learn, to help them uh, get more of an education. So I've seen this a lot. Like I've seen a lot of people, obviously the pandemic has brought out the best in some people and people have stepped up to do volunteering. And I've seen several people specifically in India build sort of mathematics apps or literacy apps, um, but none have really taken off the way yours has. I mean, yours has gotten a massive amount of adoption. It got a grant from the United Nations. I mean, it's been super successful. So what do you think you did that was different in making your app successful versus the other people who have made apps that are wonderful, uh, but have not quite taken off at the same magnitude as yours? 
what did you do that's like different sure. what they did? Sure. So uh, in terms of the app, so it's not a regular teaching app which we have built, right? It's not like it just has uh, teaching for the students. What we wanted to do was we actually wanted to gamify the space for teaching. So what we did here was we actually made this app for the teachers where teachers would have, for example, a leaderboard in terms of how they're doing in terms of their classes and make it more fun for them. Because of course, schools were shut uh, in India. There was, and we wanted the teachers to actually take small groups in the smaller schools and go and teach, for example, five to six people using ideas from the app. So we always had a leaderboard, for example, how the teachers are doing in, at the block level, at the district level. And that was, I think, a feeling of excitement, which actually you know helped the adoption go up. And of course, United Nations noted these efforts and we got a grant as well. Oh, that's great. Um, okay, so you said that your career vision is that after you go to business school, you want to eventually implement AI uh, to make, you know, NGO, um, you know, to make like the, the public sector make better decisions, such as say NGOs, for example. I can understand the benefits of using AI, right? You can comb through a lot of data, you can try to optimize for things, but are there any risks to putting some of these decisions in the hands of AI or implementing, bringing more AI into that decision making process? Absolutely, there are also going to be risks around this thing, right? Because first of all, this is really new. For it's for us for like a uh, a country like India, this is going to be a real game changer. But of course, it comes with the risks. And what are certain risks? There are certain biases which could be present in the data itself. That's that's one thing which could inherently show up, and we may not have control over that. The second is uh, if you talk about let's say the Indian government scenario or the non-profit scenario, decision making can be rigid at times. We can have strong bureaucratic hurdles. So that to uh, to to take that to the next level and get the user adoption, that can also be a bit of a challenge. Uh, I see. But nonetheless, I, I'm super convinced that this can be the changer for the the game changer for the next decade. What's been the hardest thing you've successfully persuaded someone of professionally, preferably in the last couple of years? But uh, well, well uh, at a very high level, I, I think there is at least now I see a bit of a change in the perception of how my company views artificial intelligence. Like for a traditional manufacturing company, that's like a very high level. But at an individual level, who I, when I persuaded someone was when uh, I, I think I would say. Uh, there's a very senior person in my team who's newly joined my role and he's probably double my age. And he was very, you know, I don't want to adopt this technology. I don't want to do AI, but uh, I actually told, taught him AI in a very, very, very simple way, like the business implications of it. And I think that convinced him to uh, at least start embracing this this thing and start you know being excited by it so he always asks me questions like you know can you tell me about how, how we can use ai here or there and he's a teammate in my team so i think that's something which is very recent and very uh, like a welcome change for me when i when i spoke uh, sp uh, spoke to that person All right, excellent um, I, i've seen a lot of your successes here within your application um what would you say though that you i have a pretty good sense of what your strengths are but what would you say are you not so good at what are some of your weaknesses that you're addressing right now? Uh, right now, I think one of the, the one of the weaknesses which I'm I I believe are uh, prioritization, right? Like when you take on a new role as uh, as a product manager, you have multiple priorities in terms of different business units approaching you. So, for example, you have finance wanting wanting this thing done, the HR coming in, the marketing coming in, and while within the small verticals, you can prioritize that okay, finance should go here. But overall, at a very high level, like at a strategic level, so should we focus on HR initiatives or finance initiatives? I think that is a bit uh, I feel, I find it really challenging to you know address. So, how are you managing that right now? So I uh, I always look at how my boss handles this. So my the, my boss is also in, involved with me in these discussions. So I always try to note the finer points. For example, what are the questions he asks in these important strategic meetings, and you know why didn't I ask these questions? So so I think that gives me a little bit of a pointers and in, in how I can prioritize this. And I've seen my boss does this really well. So I am trying to pick this up. Um, so we, uh, I alluded to earlier that you ha have actually moved to Europe. They actually moved you to their headquarters in Germany. Um, what was the hardest thing about adapting to living in Germany? Uh, well, for first, lots of snow. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they have a lot of snow here, but on, on a serious note, I think it was more uh, about a strict time planning, right? So when I moved from, for example, from a Southeast Asian country to, to Europe, I think in Southeast Asian country, it was more relaxed. For example, we had, uh, for example, we had flexible work hours or flexible meeting times, but when you are in Germany, it's like, okay, office starts at seven. Uh, there's a clear separation between private and uh, 
your public life and and also I, i think these two are like the main differences which i feel in terms of i think there's more structure to my work here compared to what it was but uh, maybe a little bit less flexibility so that's a bit of a challenge uh, uh, for me Um and then you took an elective in in college called the history of ideas. Uh what was like the coolest takeaway you got from that class? Uh well the the, the coolest takeaway uh from that class I, I think it was one of the ideas which I probably should have gained better but the idea here was that when you are talking about cities or when you're talking about implementing certain solutions for cities it's important for example to look at the whole situation i'll give you an example right so i think there was there was this case which we studied where uh, somebody wanted to automate the way uh, v- v- uh, women in india carried water in rural a- rural india right so they wanted to make an app or something out of it and that failed terribly and the reason was simply that the, these women actually enjoyed that journey from walking to their homes chit chatting and going there so i think the perspective of integrating the entire ecosystem and not just the solution i think that was one of the big takeaways <laughs> and yet during your the the failure that we talked about earlier exactly <laughs> you, that's okay man it's all a learning process um what book have you read recently what's the last book you read i've been reading uh, this book called atomic habits uh, which i've uh, which has actually influenced a lot of my things and i'm trying to you know change a bit of my lifestyle by inculcating certain good habits and so far i think the the book has really I love the way the book actually narrates these things through stories like you know to real life stories so I think that's that really leaves a powerful message and I'm trying to change a bit of my lifestyle uh, from that book. Excellent. Okay, well, you know that's all the time that I have for my questions, but if we had more time, what did we not cover that you wish we would have had a chance to talk about? Well, I think we discussed uh a college, we discussed uh the non-profit work, also talked about a little bit about culture. I think we covered pretty much uh, a lot of it. So I think all good from my side, Maria. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Maria. Okay, cool. So, how did that feel? Well, there were certain questions I was stumped by because uh, I felt like okay, some questions were like okay, why this, why this, but some questions I was like really out of the blue, and I was thinking on the spot. So I think I took. Uh, but overall, I think it was. I don't know. You're the better judge, but I felt uh, okay. I guess. Yeah, no. Well, first of all, I feel like I'm not doing my job. If I if I do a mock interview and the person at the end is like, "Yeah, I predicted all of your questions," then I feel like <laughs> I didn't do a very good job with my mock interview. Like part of part of the point of the HBS interview. So this is useful for everyone to hear. Um is there are lots of things they're trying to figure out when they interview you. And one of those things is how are you going to do in the case-based classroom discussion? uh and you know harvard is very is somewhat unique um uva darden also has a very case based method basically a lot of the class instead of a professor standing there lecturing to you most of the class work or learning is done by other students so you're talking all of the other students are talking you know the professor is like calling on the professor is more of a conductor calling on different students to say things at different times and so one of the things is that you you obviously don't have 20 minutes you can raise your hand and be like i'm going to drone on and on for 20 minutes because that's we don't have time for that um and the other thing is like how do you deal with these unexpected shifts in the conversation uh because i don't think i ever went to a single case class where the conversation went exactly the place i thought it was going to go uh and that's useful because in real life very rarely do things follow exactly the process we think they're going to take frequently important discussions may not follow the direction we were hoping they would take uh and so that's part of why i try to throw unexpected questions at you and that's why i think i suspect that the hbs adcom tries to sometimes throw unexpected questions on a, on a on a um another note they also try to see how you deal with people disagreeing with you i didn't really have a whole lot to disagree with you uh but also because in a case based discussion every people are going to have different opinions right and so if somebody shows up and they're like oh, i think the ceo should sell off this division and someone criticizes that idea is a person going to be like oh yeah well you don't know what you're talking about cuz i'm awesome um so we're trying to we're trying to find people who are not like that Um okay so yeah I think overall you did really well. Uh I really liked how concise your answers were. I really liked how how humble you were like you like you admitted when you know you hadn't like you're like well I can't take the full credit because I just joined etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So I liked those two things. Uh I think the one one room for improvement that jumped out and now we'll go through all the questions one by one. Um but I think one thing that jumped out was there was a, a couple of times where you sort of said like we like So we built the platform 
and the CEO liked it. And so we did this. And we, and so the, the thing is that like, we are not applying to business school, you are. And so in some of these cases, it would actually be really beneficial if you kind of tease out your very specific role in something, um, a way to bring this to life. You could describe what you did. You could also bring it to life by, in fact, sort of saying some some sort of dialogue, right? So. Uh, you know, I'm jumping ahead a little, like the the person that you were trying to convince, the sort of perhaps the older employee who is suspicious of AI, you know, maybe you could you could actually say like, well, so I said to him, look, I'm on your team here. I'm just try like, this could actually make your life so much easier. I'm trying, those things about your job that you hate, this is going to get rid of that, right? So that that can be a way to really help me picture you in that moment. Um, okay, so now let's go through... Uh, question by question, you did you did well, so I'm not gonna. Uh, sometimes I have like a lot of read, uh, but in this case, uh, you did pretty well. But let's just jump through and see if there are any if there are any uh, little things I can I can highlight. Um, okay, so why did you choose to work for this manufacturer? Um, I really love doing hackathons in college. I went to college in India's Silicon Valley. I thought that was a good way to describe the city you're from. Uh, and so they said, well, we, you did this thing in the hackathon and we'll give you a chance to come, come try it. So first of all, I was like, okay, you, you did the hackathon and they found you, but how did that connection happen? Like, how did you even hear about the company to begin with? How did, and then later you were like, oh, they hosted one of the hackathons. And I was like, oh, it all comes together now. Of course. Um, so I, I think I liked the part about I kind of want to consolidate this answer because they were like, I asked sort of a couple of different questions where you gave little snippets of an answer and I want to consolidate them into one answer. So why did you choose this particular company? Well, they had come and done a hackathon on our campus and I really, I mean, I did a lot of hackathons, but this particular one was around AI and I am super fanatical about the, the potential for AI. So this was my favorite hackathon I participated in. And afterwards they offered me a job and said, well, why don't you come and build this out for us? Um, so there were two reasons I love this. First of all, they were going to move me to another country in Southeast Asia, which I thought would be a great opportunity. And second of all, I thought, wow, this is a great chance for me to follow a passion, uh, do it for a year, see what happens, uh, knowing that I could always do something else later on or something like that. So that way we're sort of highlighting some of these key points uh, because I asked you like, well, did you know you were eventually transferred to Europe, but did you know going in that that was part of it? And you were like, no. And so I think that's, I really... I like that because it, it sort of, it does, I really believe that you took this based on intellectual passion and not because you were like, hey, can I get an EU, can I get residency in an EU country <laughs> one day? Like I'm keeping the long game in mind. Um, so I really like that sort of genuine, the genuine passion that you have for this, for me at least really came across. Um, okay, so then my next question was, how did you convince the CEO you were so far away and you were also like 22? Um, and I think the the quickest because you would have because we already talked about the hackathon in this hypothetical first answer you don't need to rebring it up. Um, so the CEO like was not fully on board. So then you said I made I made a mock UI in Facebook that sort of showed what it could be like. Um, here you said so we built the mock UI and of course it's fine if you as a team of you obviously I don't expect you to do everything ever yes. on your own. Uh, but so you could say. So I was part of a team of three that was building that was building this this product, um, and I thought, why don't we come up with like a demo before we even build the back end? Let's come up with a demo of what it would look like. Someone else on my team said, well, what about we make it like a Facebook Messenger app, right? Because that's you know everyone uses Facebook, over everyone in his generation uses Facebook, so you know like I'm not telling you to take credit for everything, but I just want to know like what exactly if you were on a team of two or three. What exactly did you contribute to that? Um, and I think you could also, there might be a good sort of lesson here to say, you know, one thing I learned from this is that it's one thing to explain to someone what a product will do, and it's very different to show them and giving them that visual sense is just goes a really long way or maybe something like that. I don't know, but maybe we don't say that because then it did not work. Uh, which is why I like this story a lot, because you had this, I mean, normally convincing the CEO of something is like the pinnacle triumph of an amazing, cool thing in your job, but nobody used it. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I applaud you for actually 
bringing that up in your application, right? You could have tried to sweep that under the rug and just make this a complete triumph story about me convincing the CEO and just not really mention the part of it. nobody use it. But I love that you sort of, you're like, uh-oh. Oh. Um, so, okay. So how, what you ended up doing, oh, what, the reason people didn't use it is because they thought it's going to take my job. Makes sense. Um, this is a common theme. People who are, you know, automating factories are finding sure. this. People who are, a lot of people are, are uh, dealing with this right now. So, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when I built it with the team, it was a new technology that no one was using it. Um, and we should have sort of inc incorporated them them sooner. Is there anything, um, do, you have an ex do you have an example of, okay, I messed this up the first time, but then the next time I learned, you know, yeah, you're right, we should have incorporated the end user sooner. We were just so convinced on getting the green light that it didn't occur to us to get to sort of you know, get a, approval or, or to get people yeah. on board with the idea. Um, but you know what, like I learned from that. And so last year when I was working on something else, I first went to seven different people. Like, can you, can you add that on to the end to really prove to me that you learned that lesson? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the point there was once we, uh, like the solution, which was built and launched, it failed. Right. So there was a takeaway there and that was to drive this change management. And the next time when we are building now, my team is building a solution. Uh, I'm responsible for training the people who are going to use it. So it's important that you go and tell them that, okay, this is how exactly this works. And this is how it's going to help you. So to do drive that change management bottom up, I think was very important. I think that's what I've actually learned and actually do it on, on, you know, on any of the products that are me and my team launch. Perfect. So the only addition I would make to that, what you just said, would be to just instead of saying, so now whenever we build a product, I make sure that I teach people how to use it. If you could instead just make it a little more specific. So ever since then, oh, for example, last year, I built a new finance product. And so I, you know, I, so it's the same story. Right. It's the same words. Just adding in a few extra details to really bring it to life. Instead of me trying Def to picture like this murky, like, okay, projects over the past few years. I can really picture like you going to the finance yes. person and uh, yeah, just to maybe give an example here. Like, let's say uh, there's a finance person who was using Excel. I'm saying, okay, why is Excel is like a really good solution? How about you know we have this dashboard which uses some uh, AI analysis behind and directly ranks these uh, customers based on the likelihood they're going to pay pay us back. So we can focus on the important ones. So and, and then teach the person actually, okay, this is how we you know how this will work. This is how the dashboard works. And now here you see uh, you're going to benefit from from this in X Y Z manner. So so I think that is something which something something like that. But is there was there also an element of asking the person like what does Excel not do easily or what do you wish it could do? And of course, of course. So that's the right. of course. Of course, yeah. that's like the starting. I, I was like going towards the end on whether the solution is built now and how do we now drive the change management. But the, the first question always starts like, you know, what are the problems you're facing today? Like in your finance world, what are the problems? What what things you think take longer than they should, for example? Yeah. And, and from there we will start uh, ideating. So the, the reason I, I, I just wanted that detail to come in is because that was the thing, because you didn't incorporate people early on, it wasn't just about the change management of them adopting it. Like maybe if you would have incorporated them early on and said, okay, what's the biggest pain in your behind about your job? Maybe they would have come up with a slightly different idea for you. So you wouldn't, have, so yes. I think in terms of the lesson, the lesson, I think the overarching lesson here was incorporate, like let's involve the people sooner. So in that case, you, I think you would just say, so for example, I, last year I went to the finance team and I said, what are the things that you're doing that you just are taking way too long that you, if I could wave a magic wand and make it faster, what would it be? And then based on that, I built a dashboard that automates their Excel reports. I don't think it matters what the, what the dashboard does necessarily, but just more like, so that I can picture you going to the finance team and what exactly did you say to them? Like Maria would say, if I could wave a magic wand, what would he do? But you probably use different terminology because you're not me. Um, so those sorts of details around more like the human sure. aspect as opposed to like, well, it was a dashboard that did a 90-day mm. moving average, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay, you get it. Um, okay, so one of the things you did is you hired a refugee. Uh, that seems like it might be kind of risky. So this person was living in that country when you hired them? Yes, I yes, yes, yes. I wasn't, I wasn't sure if they were an immigrant to... No, they were Europe. living, they were participating. So there was a competition which a company hosted internally and they were participating from that region. And I just asked them like to build a solution where they said, you know, 
it's really expensive for us to get that here. And then that, that's how the conversation started on why is it so expensive to get a sensor, for example. So. Ha. Okay. So if you're asked about this, I think it's it's important just to say, did you say in the application that you met this person through a hackathon? Maybe you did. Uh, yes, now, yes, yes. I'm reminded, yes. I'm reminded like, you did say that in the essay. I remember now. Okay. Um, but so, so the one thing was you said they're really qualified, but they didn't have enough resources. They were working for a really eminent employer, uh, but she didn't have the platform. So that was one where I was like, resources platform? And so in this case, I actually do think that saying, we were having them build a, was it like a hardware solution? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. So, you know, we were asking her to build a hardware solution um, and she needed a, a part for it. This is the part that you can get in, and so really kind of like make it clear how, like this is a part that costs only one Euro and you can get it in basically any hardware store anywhere in Germany. And yet she couldn't get a single one in her yes. entire town. Right, so do you see how that really, how that's better than like, she didn't have the platform. She didn't have the resources. I messed up there, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I'm not, you didn't mess up. It's, I'm, this is this is not a bad answer. I'm just saying, like, how can we really bring it? To, like yeah. now, I can picture her in this town, like freaking Definitely. out. Like I really want to do this competition, but I, you know, where am I going to get a flux capacitor from? Like, Definitely, I think maybe the personal details true. really add an impact. Like when I'm talking to the personal actual conversations, I think that's where the magic comes in. Yes, exactly. Because now it can, yeah, it was like, she doesn't have the platform. And I'm like, what platform? <laughs> and I didn't even catch, it didn't really, really occur to me until sort of halfway to the end of the question. I'm like, oh, she was still in that country. Because <laughs> I knew she was a refugee. Sure. For some reason when I read, and maybe you did say it and I missed it, but I read, I just was thought, because there is such a huge refugee influx in yes. the, the EU that I just thought, oh, well, she came in in one of those waves and um, but she's actually there, so of course she's not going to be able to. This was all like virtually. It's a virtual hackathon. Yeah, of yeah. course, of course, it was a virtual yes. hackathon. Uh, but I didn't know if she was yeah. like in Germany or uh, someplace else. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that I think that detail really makes it awesome. Um, and, and has that person adapted well to living in your country and in Europe? And uh, yes, yeah, so far uh, it's for for an internship. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will translate to a full-time offer, which usually happens, so. Oh, good. I love this story. Okay, this is just me, Maria. Okay, so I think my next question was, you used to be co-leading a slightly larger team, and now you are the only person leading a slightly smaller team. What's been like the biggest change or the biggest challenge in making that, that sort of transition? Sorry, you said decisions, they used to be a joint decision. You know, we, would, we would debate it with my co-lead together, now I have to make the decisions all by myself. Um, the scope has expanded and I don't really have a partner. So I have to deal with other leaders. I have to work individually with other leaders to try to convince them. Um, so I wonder if, if this might be a good place to say something like, well, we used to make all the decisions together. And did you used to pitch the senior leaders together? Or is it that now you're like yes. a completely different product? Okay. I mean, when I was co-leading together, it was a lot of things, both of us like going in together, pitching, discussing ideas, but now it's like, you know, the single person responsible for everything, something goes wrong, it's on you, so. Right. Good times. <laughs> Everyone wants <laughs> to be the leader until it turns out that <laughs> parts of it that think, uh, I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I think, so I used to have someone to bounce. I don't want it to come across that you are personally uncomfortable making decisions. Like, I don't want that to be the takeaway. But I think it's just maybe it's I'm so used to making decisions collaboratively and making the call with a peer that we would that we would debate. And so now I need to make the decisions and I need to get that information. Like, are you bouncing the idea off other people? Are you bouncing it off of your boss? Or are you saying to yourself, you know, what would my former coworker do if he were here I, right now? What would he say? Like, what, how are you managing this? I, I mean, of course, the first go-to person is your team. You always discuss it with your team. What do they think? Get their opinion. Get everyone's opinion in. Uh, uh, but maybe at times members can be shy to, you know, pitch their ideas, especially if they are younger members. When I was with the uh, like co-leading a team, of course, it was like you know a different person with a different perspective from mine, always challenging me. So we always that, that was a very quick process. But now it's like you know you have to go and ask them. Okay, what's your feedback like? Uh, what do you think? And then ultimately, most of the times you have to take the call. 
So I think that's a bit of, I think that's a better answer than now I'll say it compared I, to what I said. Well, yeah, that that specific facet of it is really interesting. It's not so much that like cuz I like I don't like making decisions like it's a lot of pressure and you know, I it's the facet of it that I find fascinating is that my co-leader used to challenge me all the time versus now that I'm the team lead, you know, people are less likely to speak up, they're a little shy. And so I really miss and so what have you, I'm sorry, did you say at the end just there, like what you've done to try to get people to debate you? Uh, I, I mean, sometimes what helps is like, instead of when you, when you pose a question in a meeting, uh, you know, you would say, uh, you wait for people to answer, but sometimes it's good to say, hey, uh, what do you think about this? For example, you know, and I, I think that really helps people to not like calling them out directly, but just encouraging them to, you know, uh, to speak. So I think that helps. That's great. Okay, see, that answers a lot. That particular facet of it, Again, this is zooming in. Instead of saying in general, it's hard to be the person. Let, like, let's zoom in on what's that very specific piece of it that is just like, oh, I wish people would tell me more often that my idea is best. <laughs> so that way we can make it better. Okay. And then regarding like having to convince the other people, when you and your former co-lead were, were doing this, was would they like take the take the lead in the presentation part of it? And so now you've had to adapt to like, make up for not having them as the show show person that's 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 true uh, they were the ones i mean we would of course discuss the ideas but uh, i was uh, he was a product manager so he would be the one doing the presentations most of the time sometimes when he's not there i would fill it fill in his space but right now it's 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 you right so i think that's also a change on that front mm -hmm. oh so this per this person was technically Either they were senior to you, or they were technically the product manager because you were yes, not yes. product. Yes. Yes. I was. I was. Uh, I was the business analyst on the project, so I was like maybe a second in command, not necessarily at the same same level. Okay, so that helps. That I think that helps the story um, a little bit because I was like, well, why weren't you also presenting? Like, but of course you weren't expected to be the one presenting. So you were co-leading a team. But the other, I was on the, the sort of analysis side. The other one was, the other person was technically the product manager. So of course he, as in his role, would be the one to get up and present in front of senior faculty, senior management, sorry, and get them their buy-in. But now I've had to take on that role and it's been, it's been challenging, um, but learning from my previous experiences, I've learned that it's best to go one by one to the people before the big meeting and try to, explain to them how this product helps them absolutely i want there to be like an end instead of just like oh gosh now i have to be the one to convince them it's really hard like okay so what are you doing about it and that's why i then asked the question of like the follow-up question was like okay so can you tell me about the time that you did like have you and you and again you've only been in this job for two months so i'm not expecting you to be to you know change the world in two months um but so have you been able to convince someone great i convinced someone that was an ongoing product and you said something like we convinced him hmm. um but i think this this one was i think the key here was not like well i came in and the product was already kind of done but i came in to bring it over the finish line and like i don't know that that part is the relevant part i think since i asked a question specifically about what did you do to convince this person just focus laser focus on like there was a finance person who didn't want to adopt this new technology so then i said to him blah 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 Sure. Um, and then if I would have said like, well, so tell me the, this particular product that you're talking about, like how did it, did, it was your idea? And then you say, well, actually it was an existing product that I took over. For, yeah. And then you go into those details. But that was, it. you know, don't, don't spend yeah. time answering and don't answer a question that wasn't asked. Because <laughs> we don't have sure, time. Yeah. Sometimes, yes, I think it's very important to get the question. And sometimes in the, you know, sometimes you just want to say what you want to say. And then you, you miss the question. I think that's, uh, yeah. Absolutely, Maria, that's true. It's so hard because you're so nervous. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> but it's, it's an important it's an important piece of it, right? Because um, in, in this case, it wasn't it, it wasn't bad, but sometimes people will will very much not at all answer the question I asked. Uh, for example, I'll give you one frequently. I'll say something like, okay, what's your weakness? And they'll say, oh, uh, blah, blah, blah. And that's why I can't wait you to go to Harvard Business School because Harvard Business School has the case method. And I love the case method. And I'm like, no, no, I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you why you wanted, I asked you what's your weakness. Like the, you know, the people try to shove in the YHBS piece 
And as an Advocate Lab user, you might already know this, but HBS is not super great. They might ask sometimes, but they're not super worried about why HBS because they're like really good school. So they assume that you want, you don't have to like prove to them, like, no, I really do want to go to. Um, so like, I'm like, no, I didn't ask you, like, do you want to marry the case method? Like that wasn't, like, I'm trying to ask, like, are you self-aware enough of what you're good at? And do you deal with that maturely? Not you trying to sell me on how great right, my case, right. I, know, I know how good my case method is. That's why I use it. <laughs> so thank you for not doing that, by the way. Um, Okay, so moving on, we then moved on to your extracurricular, one of your extracurriculars. So you helped launch a learning app. What made it successful? Um, we gamify teach. So instead of focusing, instead of focusing on teaching the student directly through the app, we focused on gamifying it for the teachers. The teachers were our end users, not the students. Yes. And so we gamified it. We made a leaderboard because they were still meeting in person five to six students at a time. That's really that's really interesting. So. First of all, a couple of questions, follow up questions. The teachers, did, did the districts or the, the uh, you know, the people who, who tell the teachers, like the people that the teachers report to, did they say, OK, you guys all need to use this platform? Or did the teachers start sort of, they suggested it and then the teachers started using it and the teachers were like, OK, this is pretty cool. So I'm going to keep. Uh, you know? uh, it was, yes, yes. Uh, it was like, uh, so the initial content on this was being uh, created. We had a team, a creation team, which actually creating this content for for giving some ideas to the to teachers how they can teach and then that's how the idea exchange began so it was very organic in that sense because we had initial team sending us some ideas and then this uh, teacher said well this makes sense and also it was like uh, the time of the lockdown so well people were spending a lot more time on their phones and you know indoors so so that was i think gave impetus to that and that's how it made it a bit easier for us to reach the teachers and then the teachers would of course find fights to six students and then impart these you know uh, whatever they learned through that app was it very was it a very deliberate choice on on your or the team's part to to target teachers from the beginning or did that just sort of organically happen as part of the uh, as the evolution mm -hmm. I think we were focused on teachers because the the, the nonprofit I'm monitoring with only focuses on improving the uh, oh. the outcomes for the teachers first like to train them professionally so so it was oh. very clear that we want to target the teachers cool okay I got that makes sense um yeah because the other the other thing I was going to think was like I wonder how many students, like I know smartphone adoption in India is, is growing rapidly, but I thought to myself, well, how many students or how many students are going to be in families with smartphones? And if the father, even if the, even if the parent has a smartphone, are they going to be like handing it to their kid for six hours a day to study? So I thought, I think it's really smart to target the teachers and then that way they can disseminate it one-on-one. -on -one. And I, and yeah. yeah, being in person is obviously better. My other final question, and the reason I'm asking these questions is to see if there are cool details that I would want to pull into this. Just one detail I wanted to add for the the, yeah. for the, the teacher. It, it was, I mean, the the audience, the, te the students which we are catering to are really young. So these are like, uh, mm -hmm. six to seven year old so they, we cannot give them like a phone and say, you know, start use teaching. So it was, that's why we had to focus on the teachers. Uh, Got it. Okay. So in this case, I wouldn't proactively bring that up unless you're asking well why why the teachers why not the students and then you say yeah. nonprofit focuses on teachers and by the way these kids are too young for phones anyway um and so finally there was like a leaderboard right you gamified it i'm a teacher in a classroom i want to get to the top of that leaderboard was there any benefit like was it just glory being at the top of the leaderboard or were there any incentives tied to that or was it just like boom i'm the best teacher in maharashtra like I think it was the, the inherent uh, impact for that was first for teaching. Teaching is a very humble profession anyway. So the satisfaction which you get by, you know, impacting lives of others is something in itself. But I think the teachers also developed themselves. For example, they got better at speaking, uh, delivering the lectures. And that personal development which came through that was definitely, I think, we did not, for example, give them any uh, monetary benefits or something like that for topping the leaderboard. But it was more that like this uh their own development which which you know i think was the driving factor so the leaderboard was driven by was it driven by how by how many modules i've taken on your app or how many students or did you track student progress and it's like oh, my student like how was that driven because then i can totally see my parents were both teachers so i can totally see like the app is tracking my students development and i see like oh they've gone up a grade level or whatever I can see how that motivating that would be. Uh, like, what was it? What was it tracking? Yeah. So absolutely, we, we uh, through through the app, we would also 
have a system of recording these the feedback right uh, so for example uh, the parents can actually use it for putting the feedback in and, and things like that so they can for example give a rating for that uh at the end of the day so we can record that and then say that okay this is how your you are ranked for example 4.7 out of 5 stars uh for that so so something like that well and the t and so it was the parents giving the ranking yes it was like because i think that for us it was i mean this is really in a very native stage right now in terms of the the the, the feedback but we don't expect the student to give that so it was more coming in from the uh from the the parents itself so that's what we we were doing it actually for us the the monitoring bit earlier we had a separate application for that where we were actually sending people to schools to actually monitor these outcomes right so for example whether students are able to recognize the words and things like that but in this during the pandemic that was not possible so the only feedback which we would get was from from the parents so that's what how we were doing it that's a great idea i think i think if you're asked about this it's about gamifying teaching there was a leaderboard and the leaderboard was driven by parent feedback on how satisfied they were with their kids learning that day. Um, and so it's very motivating for a teacher to hear that a child comes home in the evening and the parent is very happy with what the child has learned that day, or if the kid is talking about what they learned and they're so very excited as a, you know, and also the training part of it. We also had training modules to make more effective. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, because I was like the leaderboard, like what did they get like a trophy? <laughs> okay, perfect. I love this. All right. So the next question was, uh, you say for your career vision, you want to use AI to improve the work of grant writing, NGOs, I'm keeping it vague. Um, so what are some risks to that? And so, yes, it's new, the data might be biased, and it's hard to get decision makers, e.g. government officials in India, for example, it's hard to get them to change. So I think what would make this answer just a smidge stronger would be if you said, uh, for example, there's often biases in large data sets. And so one thing I'm going to be sure of is I'm going to run before we implement anything, I'm going to try to clean up the data. I'm going to make it a priority to clean up the data set and run it through by gender, by social class, by or whatever, you know, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and there's also going to be some, it's going to be hard to convince the big, the big decision makers though i'm hoping that taking what i've learned for example by building prototypes to help people visualize things i'm hoping that i'll you know i'll i'll i'll, I'll do small wins to sort of win them over yeah Maybe so, yeah, so i'm just saying here's the problem like here's how i might hmm. uh, mario just a question do you think my like uh, because of my answers were concise right so i just said there is like a bias problem in the data but like you explained it with a lot more detail like exactly how i would do it uh, but i i, I just uh, was of the opinion that the answer should be concise, just to the point to say what you do, but rather than you know, explaining. So what's your take on that? So so I don't think you have to explain. There are biases in data. For example, did you know that women and minorities tend to get really, yeah, because that the average HBS interviewer is, many of them are themselves graduates of HBS. Uh, they're a fairly intelligent, fairly well-read bunch. So I don't think you need to go out of your way to like, here are the data, here's the problem with AI specific, like the overall problems. Because if I didn't know there were problems with things like biases, I wouldn't have asked this question. I was, I asked the question expecting biases to be the answer. Um, so it's not about telling me like a bunch of background, like, well, studies show and Google has done this thing and they fired their researcher and that was terrible. Like, you don't have to do all of that. But I think just saying like, there are some biases in the data, um, I guess you could say there's some biases in the data. Maybe maybe it's more about like, there's some biases in the data. And so I think we're gonna to have to be really careful, for example, that we don't um, underfund nonprofits targeting women, right? Just something, I, I think, I think, and this is just me, I, instead of just saying, well, here's two things that's gonna be really hard. I would love for there to be an extra sentence for each one of those two things of like, sure. here's how I might think I might approach it. Um, I don't think you have to though. This is this is one. If I felt really strongly that this you have to do this, I would tell you. This is more of a gray area, but I just think, and this is just for me, it would be more sure. satisfying to hear like, a propose. Like, how are you how are you gonna fix that, man? Tough. <laughs> um. All right. All right. What's the hardest thing you've had to persuade someone of at the high level? The overall adoption of this technology. And then this was this was a good answer. Senior person twice my age. He didn't want to use the AI. 
Um, this is a very nitpicky, nitpicky, nitpicky point on my part. You said, I taught him in a simple way how the AI works. I don't want you to use the word simple because I don't want you to sort of imply that he is simple minded or that he is not very intelligent, right? So I think instead you could say, I broke it down into very into, into things that were very relevant for him or use a yeah. word like it was relevant for him or he could really picture it. Or I sat down with him and I showed him directly one task of his that could be actually made better by automation instead of like for sure for sure yeah actually i was i was like thinking of different examples in, in my head that time to which one to pick because i had some other ones as well and then oh. as i started going through this i was also still thinking about those so i think there i was a bit you know uh maybe i should have because i was not expecting such again such a question so i i it took me a while to process that and yeah I, but i think there are other examples which i can also actually think and talk about yeah, this is this is a um, and again calling them simple is, to say I explain yeah, it a simple way. Yeah, it's not it's yeah. not a huge it's not a huge like whoa that whoa buddy don't. Like the other day I was talking to someone who um, was from another from a, you know a, a non English speaking country and they referred to one of their colleagues as a girl. Like so this girl that I work with and I was like I use the word girl it's a little, like infantilizing. Uh, but in this case I'm not saying the sim simple did not certainly set off any alarm bells like that for me. But it's just, and this is kind of like a general, again, for people who are watching, you know, if you want to take away some general advice, whenever there's a situation where there's conflict involved or a misunderstanding, just be very careful that you don't throw the other people under the bus. So you don't say something like, well, you know how old, this, obviously you didn't do this, right? But you know how older people are. They just don't want to deal with technology, right? They just, oh. or, you know, I was working with these factory workers and they just don't have an education. So I really had to break it down for them, you know. So just always, always try to the 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 thing that I I teach in Applicant Lab is to to try to put yourself in their shoes and say, you know, it's understandable why the factory workers didn't want to automate the assembly line, right? They're probably worried about their jobs. I don't blame them. But blah blah blah. So that way you're not like, oh, stupid unions, you know, like factory workers. It's a, you know, it looks it doesn't look like you're putting them down. That's so you didn't do that, but that was just sort of people. Uh, and then I think I asked you, oh, what's the current weakness you're working on? Prioritization. I, I liked this answer, right? I, you know, do I do finance, marketing, HR? Um, so how I'm doing, what I'm doing about that is I'm looking at how my boss does it. What are the questions he asks? He asks and try to, you're trying to sort of glean from that, like, hmm. He's really focused on HR much more than marketing. So maybe I should be more focused on HR. Uh, are you asking your boss directly? Uh, I mean, not directly, like, you know, uh, but I just noticed the questions he, he asked because he's definitely much more like 20 years more experience than I am. And I know he, so I just try to see what are the questions he asks and what are the probing questions he asks to decide on uh, the viability of a use case, for example. And I think that is something which I need to get into the details, ask those questions. And, and I think definitely then I'll probably have a better idea of how he, how he does it. Yeah. These are questions he's asking but, you, or these are questions he's asking someone else in the broad. No, so we are in a so the, the joint meetings we go to with senior stakeholders. Sometimes he's asking a few questions and I'm asking. So I'm I'm very specifically listening to the questions he's asking to see what are the probing questions one should ask. For example, tomorrow, let's say he's not there, he's on the leave, or I'm like, I'm in charge of the meeting. What would I ask? So just to get some learning from there, I think. And I don't ask him explicitly, you know, why, but I just try to listen and, and understand what he's uh, asking. That's a that's a clever way to try to glean what he at least what he thinks the priorities are. Why, just out of curiosity, why don't you just say to him like, "Hey, Hans, or whatever his name is." No doctors. Uh, I don't think that everyone in Germany is named Hans. Um, but why don't you just say to him like, "Like, hey, like, hmm. I, what should I be prior? Like, I got three different people wanting AI stuff. What do what?" what you know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, so I met my boss right now only once in person. And uh, I'm just trying to build that that rapport with him before I get that comfortable asking all these direct questions. I will eventually, but it's, right. I'm just like one and a half months, not even two months into my new role. So it'll take a while, but I'll ask these. Uh, right. Of course, we have formal feedback sessions as well in our company. So that will also anyway come through. But right now I just didn't immediately ask it, you know, tell me what do I do? Can I do better? Okay, let, let me just get into the role. I'm just listening, learning, and I'll, I'll ask these questions. At a later point. Is it also is is he if he's very senior? Is it hard to get on his calendar? Like how many people is he managing? Yes, uh, approximately uh, 
16 17 people uh, under him but the thing is this is such a because of the wave that this ai wave have we have created in the company right from when i started and now he's joined in from very senior uh, uh, in a senior role jam packed calendars right it's very hard to you know get even like a 15 minutes slot and that's usually for tasks uh, we have time reserved for these activities as well where we are doing some uh, you know exchange of feedback and stuff which is when i have definitely asked this but for now i'm keeping it to uh, you know just watching observing and learning right So I'm, I'm trying to think if you should say, so how I'm managing it is, you know, first of all, I'm new in the role. I've only met my boss once. And so of course I asked him then, but in lieu of that, because I can't, it's really hard to get on his calendar. In, like, this is how I've been indirectly figuring out what, mm -hmm. because I don't want, I don't want it to feel like, like you're asking the, like, I love the idea of like, what is he asking about? Like, eh. I love that. I think that's super observant. But I just don't want the, the, the to come across as like, well, why don't you just ask him directly, man? Like, what's up? What's up with that? So almost like addressing it just, and you know, what, again, not a ton of details. You can just say, you know, he's really, that, that's the, the key fact for me that really clicked in my head was when you said, I've only met him once. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, that helps explain a lot of why you're not like super close buddy, buddy. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's been the hardest thing about adapting to Germany? The snow. Huh. Um, the very strict time planning in Southeast Asia were more relaxed, more flexible, and there's a clear separation between public life and private life. Uh, and so I've had to be more structured. Which one's been sort of like the hardest? Is it the structure? Like the? I think yes. I I think the the just one thing if I had to say it would be definitely the flexibility bit compared to for example uh in germany we're planning calendars way ahead right e even into the ninth or tenth month of the year it's, it's packed mm -hmm. okay this is when i would go for the vacation this is when i would go for my uh meeting this is when we talk to this boss but in when i was in malaysia it was more like let's take it like i don't know one week at a time maybe but here it is really like even if i for example i ask my boss hey uh when can i come for you know for a lunch or something if the first thing he probably do is open his calendar and see uh uh, uh. so so I think that's the that, that's what I meant when I said like a structured, uh, a very structured way of living. And so, we, for example, if work starts at eight, it starts at eight. If work ends at five, it ends at five. It's, which is very, you know, you separate that. Okay, at five thirty, I'm probably gonna pick my daughter from school. So you know, it's that's very, uh, I would say, time boxed or very structured in that way compared to what it was in Southeast Asia. Hmm. Yeah. So there are definite benefits to that, but there's also like, oh, if there's a traffic <laughs> jam on the way to work, that's yeah. Super yeah. Um. Yeah, strict time plan. I've actually heard from someone else years ago who was working in in that part of Europe that like, yeah, it's weird. Like my boss is like, okay, like here's on September fourteenth, we're gonna have a meeting. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like what? Um. Okay, I think that's a I think that's a good, you know, instead of just saying, oh, Germans are really strict because that's sort of a stereotype. I, you know, it's very. I've had to I've had to be more. Um, you know, the meeting starts at 10, it starts at 10. <laughs> no small talk. <laughs> How was your weekend? Nobody cares. Nobody talks about that. Um, it might be, I don't, I don't think we should cover it now because we are running out of time, but I, I, you know, it might be interesting for you to have an opinion on like, you know, at first I was kind of weirded out by how, not, not that you would say weirded out, but I was, you know, the, the, the stringency with the timing was you know, quite a shock to the system, but you know, I, I kind of now see the benefit of it because people yeah. can really plan their lives. Definitely. I, I mean, that is, I mean, you see yourself, you know, reaching home always on time for whatever you have. You feel just, the day feels longer when it's, you know, time boxed in a way. There are advantages, definitely. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. It's, I, I worked in India once for several months and there was definitely some times these days where it was like, we just came in, like we were just be in the office and it was like, <laughs> we just have to stay late. We just have to yeah. look like we're staying. And I'm like, why? We would come in on Saturdays and nothing would happen. And I'm like, why are we here anyway? So yeah, I can see why that would be a big change, but also like, oh, there's some there's stuff here. Um, okay so finally i i asked you oh no i didn't this was not the final this is the second to last question uh why did you take the elective history of ideas you started talking about how cities and uh, was were you talking that you question actually, that question was you, like you were talking about another elective that you took that was about cities history I, history I, of I, I, picked, 
I picked two different electives that uh, I could have asked about, and uh, one of them was is... called cities, something about cities. Uh, almost, uh, uh, almost like ten years back. So I was like, how how did she get that course? And I was just just thinking, what did I learn from that course? Okay. Uh, I remembered who the teacher was, and then I was thinking. And I think that example was actually the one which I, uh, uh, the one I which I cited about these women. Actually, that was something which was really I remember very striking about that course. It was, I think, in in the history of, uh, it was in history of ideas. Yes, I think it was. Okay. I'm not sure if it was in history of ideas on cities because we had two these uh, these courses which we call here social science courses. But okay. there's also this, but it was one of them. But I'm not really now able to recall which one was it though. Okay. Well then, maybe if you're asked about history of ideas and don't bring up like, oh, we were learning about cities in the class, because I'm like, oh, so is he actually answering about social sciences 102, the city, <laughs> or whatever the name of the class? I've got the transcripts here. <laughs> HBS, anything is fair game. All right, but it was good Absolutely. though because instead instead of just saying, well, the class is about we looked at the history of innovation throughout the centuries and blah. Like you, I really liked your answer. It was very specific, and it was like, like, oh yeah, that's right. Sometimes. You know, when we think we're solving a problem, we're actually creating a different problem, like social, social alienation. Uh, what's the last book you read or book you're reading? Atomic Habits. Um, I've started changing a few of my habits, and I really like that he uses stories. So what I liked about this answer was that you, you actually made it. You didn't start explaining to me what Atomic Habits is about, or it's written by James Clear, and it's divided into 18 chapters, 432 pages. Like not that you would do that. I'm using hyperbole <laughs> to make a point. Um, but instead of telling me like what the book is about, which is a big trap I think people fall into, you were telling me like, here's, here's what I'm taking away from it, right? You could even say like the current habit I'm working on is trying to eat more vegetables. Um, and so it's been really like, I just try to eat like a little bit more vegetables every day to try to get into it. Um, and the way how he uses stories, like some other books about this topic are very Definitely. like, you have to do this and you're weak if you don't do that. And they're just sort of scolding you, but this, this just sort of tells stories that inspire me to change. And then what did we, is there anything we didn't cover? And you were like, no, we covered just about everything. So great. So that folks concludes the mock interview plus the feedback session. I think you did, I think you did well. Um, I think you've got some really great stories to tell. Like you have, some of these are really interesting. So I am happy about that. Um, it is Thank now you. nine. It is, it is now 9.02. Well, for me, it's 9.02. <laughs> um, and so I I don't know if anyone has any any questions. Um, I, I'll just sit here for a few questions. You know, um, my, my, my kind and generous user, uh, you are off the hot seat officially now. So if you want to uh, sign off, <laughs> you can. I think I'll stand. I'll hang back for a few more minutes and answer a few questions uh, in case there are any. But thank you oh. so much for your time. And my my pleasure, Maria. It was lovely, you know, having this experience and the uh, the questions, some of which really threw me off, and getting the specific feedback. I think this was phenomenal. And uh, I'm hoping now to, you know, uh, work back on some of these points. So thank you, thank you so much, Maria. Great. Thank you for for of having course. me. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. All right. So as uh, Abhijit from GMAT Club knows. <laughs> On these things, I tend to just go for a long time. Um, so I will try to sit back. I think I've got about 10 or 15 minutes right now ish that I could spend going over time. So let's see what my questions are. All right. Someone is saying if there's volunteer exposure, is this some sort of thing where like, I can click on it and it shows up? Nope, no, it's not working. Oh, well. Um, if there's volunteer experience from an NGO like Teach for India, what are the kinds of questions to expect? So I think the questions tend to be around, um, you know, in the in the resume, for example, in your application, you would probably tell me what you did. You know, I helped teach eight, you know, eighth grade students and I helped them advance two grade levels or something. Like that. those, those are normally the sorts of um, things I see when for something like Teach for India. Right. Uh, I think it's if you are going to get questions, it might be something it's, it's specific to what you did. Right, so I was part of a team that helped get more textbooks to children in a certain city. Okay, so what did you do? Like, did you come up with the idea to get the books? Did you approach the book publishers and ask for free books? Did you, so sort of getting at the root of what you did, because um, you know, in the application, there's only so much room, right? So really trying to get at that. You might also get questions sometimes about um, motivation, 
or at least I sometimes like to ask questions about motivation because one thing that I personally, and this is just me, uh, one thing that sort of drives me nuts is when I get the sense that people are just doing volunteer work for the sake of their business school application and that they're not truly passionate about whatever it was, like, oh gosh. Uh, like, ho oh, oh, my I'm reading on the message boards that I should do volunteer work. Oh, well, I guess I'll sign up for something. Um, so that's why sometimes I tend to ask, like, so what what got you into this? So I'll give you an example. The other day, um, I was doing a mock interview for someone who had done uh, something for breast cancer research. And this person was male. And of course, not just only, it's not only females can be interested in breast cancer, research, of course. But I was like, it was just sort of random. Like, it was like, there was nothing else that was really, and I was like, so why'd you get interested in this? And then he explained like, oh, because, but he had a very personal story as to why. And I was like, bingo, makes sense. So then it helps me understand not only the origin, but like, okay, this is a sincere thing that you really care about. It wasn't just like, ho-hum, let me check the box of volunteering. Okay, regarding round one for this upcoming season, how should you start your, how should I start with your interview prep with Appleton Lab? Round one for this is coming. So, so, I mean, if you've got, you know, round one as of right now is about six, seven months away. So, I mean, Applicant Lab is more than just interviews, right? I cover the whole strategy. I cover individual school essays, letters of recommendation, the whole thing. So you could probably uh, start now. Uh, I also do sell the interview module by itself. So for a, a lower price, obviously, I, I would I would wait until you actually get an interview invite to buy the module. I don't want you to spend a ton of time. And then what happens if the interviews, you know, may not happen, you know, you can help maximize your chances of getting the interview though, by if you have a good story, learning how to tell that story. Well, Sandeep wants to know, oh my gosh, sorry. So I'm just going to jump to Yorkis Estrella. Your interview with HBS is later on today. Yorkis Estrella, buena suerte. I don't know if Estrella means that you speak Spanish, pero si hablas español, buena suerte. Estoy contigo en espíritu. All right, uh, Sandeep wants to ask, can you throw some light on the Harvard 2 plus 2 program? What are the requirements for that? So, um, you know, 2 plus 2, for those of you who don't know, 2 plus 2 is a program where college seniors or people, if you went from college directly to, let's say, a master's in engineering, if you're in your last year of graduate school, you can apply for HBS. That means you get in now, but you don't enroll for another two, three, or four years. Uh, the two plus two program, it's, I actually have a pretty long, I have a draft of a pretty long article because I was actually, I was actually a volunteer with the HBS admissions office when they were coming up with two plus two. Uh, and I'll tell you the origin of two plus two. And I think this is helpful to know the origin. The, one of the reasons it was started was to try to bring people who would not otherwise apply to Harvard business school. It was to try to get people who Maybe we're thinking of law school or we're thinking of public policy school or we're thinking of, you know, getting a master's in education. And so part of it was like, OK, we need to get to people when they're younger and tell them, like, there are lots of ways to make an impact in your community. It doesn't have to be a social work. You don't have to. It doesn't only, you know, it's not only through social work or only through being a teacher that you can make an impact. And MBA can be a great way to make an impact. So it originally targeted people who were like engineers, people who had a really big social, you know, uh, social bent. Um, you know, it was not targeting business people. Now it's expanded. I mean, this was, when was these discuss these discussions were like in 2004, I think. So now it's been a long time. So now the program is up and running. So now they do accept the business types, but I think two things, if I had to summarize. Number one, keeping in mind that they, the spirit of the program is to let people in who might not otherwise consider an MBA. Um, if you were like a finance major, and your summer internship was at McKinsey, and then you're going to McKinsey after business school, you're actually, I think, slightly less likely to get into two plus two, in my opinion, because honestly, like, I don't know if any, there are any Hamilton fans watching this, but like, as, as King George sings, like, you'll be back, right? I know, if you were a business major, whatever, you're going to McKinsey, you're going to KKR, or Goldman, whatever, I know that you're going to be in my applicant pool three to four years from now. So why would I waste a two plus two spot on you now, knowing that I'm going to see you again anyway? Um, now there are some people who are getting it early. And I think in that case, it's like, okay, should we grab them so they don't go to Stanford in four years? I can't, that's me, my unofficial, very unofficial. But it does tend to be people from less, people who were very involved in the arts in college, um, people who are aspiring entrepreneurs or who started a business in college. 
Uh, so it, it is also about being a, a really extraordinary leader. I believe it's harder to get into, into two plus two than it is to get in normally only because there's so much less data to go on. So for regular HBS admissions, like, yeah, you have to have done well in college and whatever, but really the focus otherwise is on your professional accomplishments. Since a two plus two candidate does not really have a ton of professional accomplishments, it puts so much weight on that undergraduate, just being a complete rock star. Uh, so anyway, if you have not been like a, a standout leader in your university, um, if you haven't like, I don't know, it just, it's, it's for people who are more interesting. It tends to be for people who are like sort of a little more interesting and off the beaten path, usually. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want advice on how to approach the goals question during the interview when you are not 100% sure about it. In my app, I had written that my post MBA goal is management consulting. Um, I don't know if you, if you're, if you're saying that your app for HBS was about management consulting, I think what HBS might do is they might say something like, okay, fine, you want to work in consulting. Lots of people want to do it, whatever. But if you didn't do consulting, where would you want to work and why? And or what industry would you want to work in? Um, do you want to stay in your industry? Do you want to go work in a new industry? Okay, what company do you admire in that industry? What do you think they're doing well? Things like that. Um, I, I would hope that management consulting is not the sort of the end goal of where you want to end up just because A, it's not a super interest, it's not that interesting of a story. Uh, and B, because frankly, a lot of people don't stay in management consulting their whole careers. Obviously, some people do, but you know, here's what I tell people like every year you read about these firms coming and hiring, you know, in aggregate hundreds of MBA graduates. Why do they have the room for hundreds of fresh graduates? It's because hundreds of people have quit. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's because they're growing them. But I mean, if people joined consulting and stayed with consulting for the rest of their lives, if everyone did that, they wouldn't be. So anyway, just take that for what it's worth. I would have an opinion about something that is not management consulting. I would also have an opinion about why, why is management consulting useful for the thing you ultimately want to do? Like, why is this the right path for you to take eventually okay crazy crypto airdrops nice username uh wants to know i'm 40 years old i'm working in india i'm planning to start gmat prep and i want to enter into a top 10 b school like hbs please guide me crazy crypto airdrops while i love your username i have to be the bearer of bad news i think it's very difficult for someone at age 40 to get into hbs is it possible sure is it common i don't even think all that remotely. Um, so just to give you a sense, at least, you know, usually when people get in at slightly older ages, um, and when I say slightly older, I mean like 32, <laughs> I don't mean 40. Uh, it's because for example, they have worked for a large multinational corporation and they've been climbing the ladder and now they have like significant experience. Uh, often people, these are people from other countries where they're company is sponsoring them. That means they are, the company has said, we're gonna pay for the MBA. The company has said, uh, in one case, I helped an older candidate get in because the recommender said something like, we've identified this person, like the CEO thinks that this person 30 years from now might be the CEO of our business um, and their business also pays. So it's, if you're from the business world and you're applying later, it has to be, it's, it's just tougher. Um, or it's people who were in the military, or it's people who are chronologically older, they're in their 30s, but because they spent eight years in medical school and two years in residency, or they spent seven years getting a PhD. And so it's more about the years of work experience and the chronological age. But again, if you have more than five, eight, 10 years of, of work experience, I think it's going to be really hard for you uh, to get accepted to a top, a top business school only because um, it's, it's, they're thinking about not just you, but they're thinking about their employers that come to campus. And given that campus recruiters are looking for, excuse me, sorry, I just swallowed some dust. Just a moment. Oops, I just inhaled some dust and it was like, ah, sorry. <laughs> the recruiters are looking for like young, energetic people that they can work very hard. <laughs> like they pay them well, but they also work them hard. So I just, it's tough. I don't know that a lot of recruiters would be like, wait, this guy's going to be 40 and your boss is going to be 28. So like, how's that? 
So it's just, there are a number of reasons why I think it's difficult. Um, if you really want to say, come study in the US, you might be better off studying for the GRE and instead applying to a STEM graduate program. Uh, and I mentioned STEM specifically because STEM has a better OPT visa situation at the end. So anyway, uh, so, but there, like the MBA is not the only way to get, if, for example, if the end goal is I want to, you know, emigrate, I want to go to America, then, for example, uh, there are other ways to do that. There are other degrees that might be a little bit easier to get into. They might be a little bit more open, like off the top of my head, something like a master's in data science. Um, someone like that might be a little bit, those programs would be a little more open. Um, if it's STEM designated, you're still going to get a good sort of a, a better visa situation than you would if you were studying something else. So I would look at that. I just, I think it's, I think it's tough. If you're 40, what I would look at uh, just finally uh, is I would look at say Stanford MSX, uh, MIT and, and LBS, London Business School, both have a program called the Sloan Fellows Program. That's more for mid-career, middle-aged, uh, that's, that's more for more, what I like to diplomatically call more seasoned candidates. So those programs are going to be better for you to look at. Sorry, crazy, crazy crypto airdrops. <laughs> okay, what are the chances of an Indian software engineer with Accenture with three years of work experience to get into HBS level? So uh, your question is, you know, I, I've got a little thing in Applicant Lab, and I think this is part of the free trial. So it's not like, oh, she's trying to sell me on her product. I'm pretty sure you can access this module for free. Uh, I call it the resume twin. Thing. So when you work for a big company like Accenture or in a Deloitte, PwC, whatever it is, the best way to know which schools you have a good chance of getting into, because firms like this tend to send lots of people to business schools, is to find people who were just like you prior to business school and then ask, where did they end up? So really, you're trying to look for the person who was you three to five years ago. And so if your office, let's say you're in the Bangalore office of Accenture and you have three years of experience, when other people, you can't be the first person in your office at Accenture that's thought of applying to an MBA program. So when other people from your division of Accenture, from your office, from your specific role, right? Because there are a lot of different roles. Um, when someone whose resume looks a, looked a lot like yours looks now, where do they go to school? And so that's, honestly, that's the best way to start to figure out which schools are going to be like the most promising for you to, to perhaps get into uh, because there's pattern matching, right? So if a school has accepted someone from the Bangalore office of Accenture that does the exact same job you did and they come to the school and they're awesome and they kick lots of butt and they're engaged in the community, then the next time I see someone with a similar background, I'm going to have like a positive feeling about them. Um, so that's going to be your first, your first place to start in terms of like, what are the chances of you getting into INSEAD, HEC, LBS, and other top devs? Um, I can't tell you for HBS, it really depends so much on the, de the devil's in the details for these, some of these top schools. It's, uh, hopefully you've been like a real standout. Hopefully you've, you know, worked, you've really driven a lot of positive change for your clients. Um. And then INSEAD, HEC, and LBS. So you're too young probably for HEC. Just off the top of my HEC tends to skew older. Um, LBS maybe, INSEAD also skews a little bit older and INSEAD really loves to see a lot of significant international experience. So, you know, ideally that means living abroad. So the person I was just interviewing who lives in Germany, that person has a really good shot of getting into INSEAD, right? Uh, if you haven't lived overseas, if you haven't worked overseas, it's a bit harder because it's like the, the INSEAD is the international business school. So it's tough. Um, but that's why I'm telling you like ask around, like maybe a Warwick, I don't know, off the top of my head or like other like Ross or Duke or a whole bunch of other programs. Uh, I would have to know so much more and it's impossible unfortunately that's why those all of those like rate my chances things on it's often not useful <laughs> uh okay and translate saying in my app i wrote that my long-term aspiration was to be a director of a global company in my current industry okay 
I, at least that's fine. At least you weren't like, I wanted to suddenly change and become an astronaut, ballerina. Like, um, so at least it, it's logical. Yeah, I think just be ready to explain what it is about consulting that will make you stronger in the long term. The easiest answer I'm going to tell you, like one of the easiest answers is like, oh, in consulting, I'm going to be working with lots of different companies and I'm going to learn all kinds of all kinds of best practices, um, what works, what doesn't work. And then I can apply that to uh, my future job. Um, you also might want to actually, I don't know that HBS would ask this, but also like ask people, hmm, it, it sort of say like, okay, well, I've asked people who went into consulting and here's what they've said. So if you can, I don't know when your interview is, but if you can like, if you didn't already find your resume twins, as I mentioned a second ago, resume twins who then went into consulting, if you happen to have found any, then you can also mention them. Cause then it's like, oh, three other people who used to work at Accenture in Bangalore. Let's see, I'm gonna combine you with the last question asked. Like three other people ended up working for BCG after business school. So I wanna work at, you know, I would love to work at BCG because blah, blah, blah. Like at least that way it's like, okay, you know, there's, you, you've researched like what that job is, how do people get that job? What are the benefits? Like, what are you going to take away from that job, et cetera? And the final question for the day, does HBS love trucking? Um, uh, they love it just as much as they love any other hobby that someone could have. So like the hobbies and things, wait, did I miss a question up above? I feel like I missed a question. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Well, I'll, I'll get to you, the person that I missed in a second. I mean, they don't dislike trekking. I personally feel that trekking, trekking doesn't really benefit other people and trekking, I mean, it might involve teamwork, like, hey, we're all stuck in a mountain and you're out of water. So here, take my water. I don't know. I, it's just not as, because it doesn't impact other people as much. It's more of like a, I'm doing this to get out in nature and enjoy myself aspect of it. Um, I think it would it would be sort of seen as being on par for me as like someone who runs races or you know someone who's like an active jogger or who likes to do crossfit or who likes to i know that trekking is not about working out and exercise but it's i think that's where i would lump it in so uh i do not think it would make really a huge if you're asking like is that going to help you get into business school the answer is no um someone's asked just asked another question but unfortunately i have said that i'm done except for rang and roy who asked is volunteer work absolutely necessary uh no it's not absolutely necessary if somebody has amazing work experience and some some admissions consultants out there are like oh you have to have it and hurry up and sign up for some, like your application's due tomorrow well up and get at least one day of volunteer you think admissions officers can't see through that like if you if the applications do in September and you suddenly start you've never volunteered ever in your life and you suddenly start volunteering in June, like come on, it's gonna look super fake. Um, so volunteer work shows me that you care about other people, that you can manage your time well if you have a demanding job and you can do volunteer work. Uh, and often volunteer work, the reason it's useful is because it can lead to amazing leadership opportunities. So the person that I just interviewed in the mock, that particular volunteer work that particular volunteer thing ended up having a huge impact on people like i said it got it was given a grant from like the united nations it was adopted by a ton of people so that the reason that's useful for me is in part because i'm like oh this is a good person but for me it's also about like wow this is someone who makes things happen right what a cool leadership experience to work on a product like this and to get it out there and to get that user feedback and you know all that stuff so the, re the real reason volunteer work is often, for me, useful is because aside from being like, oh, that's interesting, they care about breast cancer research, it's a chance for people to show leadership. So simply volunteering, like showing up and like giving blood once a month, great, I salute you, that's wonderful, but it's not really leading things. So to the extent that a volunteer activity can help you develop leadership skills or prove that you have leadership skills outside of your work environment, that to me is the biggest benefit. And I have worked with people who have not had any volunteer experience, really, uh, because they were working, because they were, they might be from a country, first of all, where volunteering is not like as big of a deal as it is here in the US of A. Uh, and honestly, like someone who is like, 
running a $50 million P&L and managing a division for a multinational corporation at age 27, like that person's going to get into a great business school. They haven't done any volunteer work. Okay, well, that stinks, but I'm still going to let them in because they are clearly amazing at business. <laughs> so uh, if you don't have volunteer work, it's not strictly mandatory. But what is mandatory is having accomplishments. Uh, you know, the more, the, the, the better the accomplishment, the better your application will be. And with that, folks, I do have to sign off. I know some last minute questions came in, but unfortunately I did cut them off a few minutes ago. So thanks everyone for joining and check out Applicant Lab, please. Uh, let me know what you think about it and have a great rest of your day or night. Bye.